You okay back here recording? Okay. Just as an orientation, I want to make sure there are extra handouts. And the reason why I have these extra handouts, I wanted to blow up the brachial plexus, but also have it by your side for when we do the examination, okay, uh, when we do the actual test questions. There's extra handouts right up here, up here in front. Now, one of the things that I want to mention before we begin, just give you a little orientation to the handouts that I have, some of the diagrams that I have in your handout are not labeled. And that's very important. It's not to penalize you. It's because what I found out when I took my board exams, I, I put a note on what diagrams they used during my exam, and also the year previous asked them what diagram. I tracked it back that the diagrams they're actually using were from an academy publication in 1992. And I've included those in your handout. So you are actually then going to practice the diagrams that I feel are going to show up on your test. So if you see a diagram in the handout that's blank, that's for your benefit. Those are the ones that I got from the Academy publication, as I mentioned, I think will show up on your examination because they showed up on mine. Okay? So one of the reasons why this anatomy review was brought into this course is although that on a day-to-day -day basis we're intimately associated with anatomy by doing surgery, a lot of times we don't focus on key testable material. That's my job today, is to show you the key testable items. And the way I've broken up this lecture is we're going to begin on the upper extremity first, then go uh, to the forearm, then the spine, lower extremity. At the end of each section, I have my top five or ten list. Those I highlight the top five or ten points that are, I feel are key testable items. There are summary handouts also provided, and we are going to focus on the key testable material. So essentially, we're going back to school, and this slide never works in West Virginia. I know there's two people right here from West Virginia right in front. This, this doesn't work too good. I was from West Virginia myself. We, didn't, we would have never got this slide what was wrong with it. Now, let me show you how I reviewed on anatomy, and the next diagrams I'm going to show you are actually from Hoppenfeld's Orthopedic Neurology Atlas. One of the things you want to do is start integrating material. So, for example, motion along with brachial plexus function. So here, shoulder abduction, suprascapular nerve, one of your preclavicular nerve branches, C5, shoulder abduction, in addition to the deltoid. Elbow flexion and extension, musculocutaneous nerve. Musculocutaneous nerve, don't forget, its end branch is the lateral anabrachiocutaneous nerve. Radial nerve does the triceps. This diagram actually helped me out on my, my examination, board exam. The question was, you've already had the spine lecture, right? Most common level of uh, cervical disc herniation is 5-6, so you'll have impingement of C6 nerve root. C6 nerve root would show up on EMG as a dysfunction, as fibrillations and sharp, sharp waves in what muscle? And look up here on the diagram for C6. Extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. This is a diagram actually helped me out on one of my test questions for the board examination. Median nerve does flexi carpi radialis. Ulnar nerve is flexi carpi ulnaris. Finger extension and flexion, shown here. Finger abduction and adduction. Don't forget interossea, ulnar nerve. And brachial plexus, we're going to spend probably five minutes right now on the brachial plexus because it is key testable material. One of the things that Dr. Miller said during my review course is true. The test is easier once you know the answers to the questions. Makes sense. Brachial plexus, it is a data dump. You're expected to know. That's why I have on expanded format the handout, the brachial plexus diagram. One of the key tricks that they try to do on examination, when you look even at this a handout, the orientation, a lot of times what you'll find out they'll do when you practice self-assessment examination, they'll just flip the diagram, reverse it, just to, just to fool with your orientation. They also love to do that on acetabular or screw placement. They'll have a diagram. We'll go over those actual questions. They'll just flip the diagram and it'll fool you what, where's the safe quadrants. So they love reverse orientation on these diagrams. So even look at it front and back, okay? Ventral primary rami, C5 to T1, sclenus anterior and medius. Preclavicular nerve branches are the key testable item, okay? There's four of them. The dorsal scapular nerve to the rhomboids, the long thoracic nerve to the serratus anterior, the suprascapular nerve to the supra and infraspinatus, and the nerve to the subclavius. What is the arrangement of the brachial plexus? Ron Taylor drinks cold beer. The roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. Do not forget the cords are labeled in, in its relationship to the axillary artery, lateral, posterior, or medial to it. This is a diagram that I provided, and we're going to go over that on test questions. Have that in front of you. This shows an anatomic specimen here. 
representation of what the cords look like. Cords right here in this area, medial, lateral, and then posterior to the axillary artery. Precavicular nerve branches, remember there's four. Look at the diagram, know where they're at on the diagram. Dorsal scapular nerve, long thoracic nerve, long thoracic nerve palsy of serratus anterior causes that medial scapular wing. Suprascapular nerve can be entrapped at several places, and we'll go over those test questions. There's four preclavicular nerve branches. How do you determine them preganglionic from postganglionic brachial plexus lesions? It's medial scapular winging. Horner's syndrome, if there's an injury to the inferior ganglia of the brachial plexus or the stellate ganglion. And something that I haven't seen tested in years, but actually it was some of the material that I was reviewing for my board exam. It's also associated with something called a positive histamine response. And here's a clinical diagram. Patient had trauma, medial scapular winging. Also, remember I said on the preclavicular injury that you're looking for injury to the stellate ganglion or inferior ganglion. Horner syndrome. So if I ask you the question, here's what they're doing on the exam. Patient has definite preganglionic brachial plexus lesion. They ask you, how's his forehead going to feel on the side of injury? Wet or dry? It's going to feel dry. And the reason, easy way to remember that is a MAPE. Anhydrosis, lack of sweating. Horner syndrome, you have meiosis, pupillary constriction. Ptosis of left eye, sit in. Left forehead will be dry. So they'll throw these little curveballs at you, how the forehead's going to feel. It's going to feel dry. So what, what else will they do? A lot of times you're looking for medial scapular wing, you see this. You have bilateral, what appears to be medial scapular wing, but really what's the true differential diagnosis of, I told you, this person didn't even have trauma? Any guesses? Autosomal dominant, the family has it also. Fascial scapular, scapular uh, humeral dystrophy. So they'll throw these curveballs. You're looking for the scapular wing, you're looking for it, it's not even it. This is a great picture. You see the scapular spine, so you know there's atrophy in both the infraspinatus and also supraspinatus. The question then is, is this patient doesn't have a rotator cuff tear, is this a supraclavicular infraclavicular pattern? And the reason why I put this test question on, they try to fool you also, is pre- or post-ganglionic, pre- or post-clavicular type injury. And what is this then? So you have suprascapular nerve involvement. It's one of the preclavicular branches. So right there, you have infraspinatus, supraspinatus wasting, suprascapular nerve involvement. So it's a pre- or supraclavicular pattern. Do not forget what this looks like on MRI. This is one of their favorites also. A lot of times we look at MRIs for any kind of rotator cuff pathology, retraction, fatty infiltration, things like that. But look at the rotator cuff here. It's still attached. So this is a representation of denervation atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus in the supra and infra uh, scapular fossas. Do not forget what that will look like. What nerve can be trapped in a spinal or glenoid natch? Remember how I told you one of the things they like to do is flip your diagram? That's why I included this. They just flip the diagram. Preclavicular nerve branch, which one? Why? Suprascapular nerve. Be aware of rotated diagrams. Another key testable item, you have a ganglion cyst in the spinal glenoid notch. If you have nerve entrapment of the spinal glenoid notch, the muscle you're going to affect is the infraspinatus only. So you're, you're blocking off the supraclavicular nerve. The reason why this is also key testable material is whenever you see this, what else do you think of? Labral pathology. Nerve entrapment of spinal glenoid notch can result in atrophy of which muscle? The infraspinatus. Don't forget the notch up above is a suprascapular notch where water runs over the bridge. The artery is actually over the superior transverse scapular ligament. The nerve is underneath that ligament. Spinal glenoid notch is further distal. That's why it only affects the infraspinatus. If you have nerve entrapment at the suprascapular notch, you will affect both the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. One of the things they also like to do is do, do tests that you haven't seen during your residency. This is a diarthrogram showing a rotator cuff tear where you have diastravization outside the rotator cuff and, and the uh, shoulder capsule. What is the most commonly torn muscle in rotator cuff pathology? Answer? Supraspinatus. Innervated by a branch of what? Look at your diagram. So we know it's suprascapular nerve from what? The upper trunk. You know how I told you they're going to have you jump through multiple hoops to get an answer? This is really more representative of a board-type question. 
This is one I had to spot him during my exam. I just remember because I didn't know what it was. The nerve pierces the scalenius medius muscle, runs posteriorly on the deep surface of the scapulae, descends along the medial border of the scapula. Dorsal scapular nerve to the rhomboids, C5. Obstetrical palsies are also fair game. Herb Duchenne's is the best, C5, C6. I'll show you a picture of what that looks like. The worst is total plexal, plexi, uh, plexus involvement. What does this patient have? Herb Duchenne's palsy. Arm held in extension, internal rotation because you have paralysis of the external rotators. Don't forget, uh, I put down there additional information, large baby, shoulder dystocia, forceps, breech delivery, prolonged labor. You maintain passive range of motion, 90% recovery, and you follow the biceps. It's the best prognosis. Termination of each cord, key testable material. Lateral cord is muscular cutaneous nerve, which then terminates as the lateral anabrachial cutaneous nerve. Posterior cord is radial and axillary. Medial cord is ulnar. Medial lateral cord as the median nerve. Which nerve is formed by the posterior cord? Well, the posterior cord goes down the radial and axillary. If you now know the radial nerve crosses now from lateral to medial, you already got, I mean, medial lateral, you got it on the diagram. The uh, spiral groove is approximately 13 centimeters up from the elbow joint, pierces the lateral intermuscular septum about 7.5 centimeters up from the lateral epicondyle. So the answer is one, the radial nerve. Nerve labeled E innervates which of the following muscles? This is more representative of a type of question. E is the what? Musculocutaneous nerve innervates the coracobrachialis. Name the three nerves, and this is actually some of the pimp material they do give on you. Name the three nerves that arise from the medial cord. Medial cord is shown there as R. You have to know the orientation, medial pectoral nerve, medial cutaneous nerve, medial anobrachial cutaneous nerve. And the key test of one out of that is probably medial anobrachial cutaneous. Runs with the basilic vein, is also injured during elbow arthroscopy portal placement. The nerve responsible for skin sensation on the medial forearm, don't forget anatomic position, is this way. Medial forearm is right here. Okay. Medial forearm is which one? They'll actually ask you to pick which one nerve it is. Which one out of the bunch? Medial outer brachial cutaneous was the most distal one. It's you. Basilic vein, we already mentioned it runs with, and it's then at risk of elbow arthroscopy portal placement. The three nerves that arise from the posterior cord, upper subscapular, thoracodorsal, and lower subscapular. What nerve arises from the posterior cord between the upper and lower subscapular? Thoracodorsal to latissimus dorsi. 18-year-old motorcycle accident, brachial plexus traction injury, no shoulder abduction, external rotation, or elbow flexion. Rem remember what you were trying to look for is determine whether it's preganglionic, postganglionic lesion. As you read through the rest of the question then, is that he has normal scapular control. So you know it's a postganglionic lesion. Where is that going to be at on the brachial plexus diagram? At Herb's point, which corresponds to B. This is a great test question. This one I had trouble with. Structure innervated by the air and the MRI is innervated by what nerve? And first you have to guess what structure it is. Then you have to guess what nerve. It's lower subscapular nerve because it's the teres major that they're pointing to. Teres major muscle, lower subscapular nerve. Innervation to the pectoralis major comes directly off the brachial plexus. Look at your diagram here. Lateral pectoral nerve off the lateral cord. The medial pectoral nerve off the medial cord. Easy way to remember that, which is the clavicular head. L is in the lateral pectoral nerve. Clavicular head of pectoralis major is innervated by fibers from which nerve roots? Well, we knew it was off the lateral cord coming from the upper trunk, C5, C6. AC joints and clavicle, sternoclavicular joint. Do not forget the CC ligaments. The coenoid is most medial. Trapezoid is lateral to that. That supplies superior restraint to the acromioclavicular joint. The capsule at the AC joint and the AC joint ligaments are both anterior-posterior direction. 
Do not forget one of the key testable ligaments actually on the shoulder is the coracochromial ligament for two reasons. One, it's very important in massive rotator cuff tears, and I'll show you the question next. Two is because a branch of the thoracochromial artery, the acromial branch, travels along with this ligament. So if you debridement, you get brisk bleeding. It's from that vessel itself. Test question. Which of the following steps is important when debriding painful massive rotator cuff tear that cannot be surgically repaired? Well, you want to do something to prevent proximal humeral migration. So you preserve the coracochromial ligament to, to maintain the superior joint stability. Also, don't forget about the contribution of deltoid to AC joint stability. The test question I had on my board examination was, is that if you have a person with an AC joint injury and you ask them to passively contract the deltoid, if the deformity lessens, you know it's still attached. If the deformity stays the same, you know it's not attached. Distinction between type 3 and type 5. Posterior sternoclavicular dislocation, this was actually on my boards also. The test question was actually very simple. What do you also need when you're going to reduce this in the operating room besides a roll between the shoulders? You need a thoracic surgeon there just in case. Reduction with a thoracic surgeon available. Strongest ligament is posterior. Do not forget that any kind of hardware in this joint has been associated with fatal migration and therefore is contraindicated. It's not a test answer. Bonus question, not in your handout. Posterior sternoclavicular dislocations are most commonly associated with which of the following complications? This is the brand new uh, stuff in the computer lab. Most commonly associated with tracheal compression. Shoulder review. Position the humeral head in relation to the transepicondylar axis, distal humerus. Don't forget, it's 20 to 30 degrees uh, retroversion, but the glenoid is also 5 degrees retroverted. Looking at the sits, the rotator cuff, and its attachment. This diagram is actually very good because two anatomic relationships that are key tests of material. One I'm going to highlight right here. Do not forget that number 8, which is shown... Shown here on the diagram, number eight is the middle glenohumeral ligament. Number nine is the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. The one thing you'll notice during the shoulder arthroscopy on the picture is the middle glenohumeral ligament sits directly in front of the subscapularis. Okay? The other thing is, is if I highlight this portion on a diagram, the thing they'll try to fool you on is just change the diagrams. What is this space right here? Let me give you a hint. Posterior humeral circumflex artery and the axillary nerve. Quadrangular space, and we're going to go over the test questions for that. So don't forget to change some of your diagrams and the way you look at it. And cross-sectional anatomy is all key, always key testing material. Label the following surgeons to the proximal humerus. Easy way to remember this is latissimus is in the, in the middle. Pectoralis major, lateral. Middle is latissimus. Medial is teres, major. What attaches to the lesser and greater tuberosity is the humerus. Greater tuberosity has the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. The lesser has the subscapularis. One of the test questions that is, is ripe for this is that both the internal and external rotators, rotators that attach to these tuberosities are all innervated by C5 and C6. Okay? The other thing to also to mention is don't forget one of the things they'll try to do to you, even though they, they, we call those the internal rotators, that's not the, all the internal rotators to the shoulder. Because think about what happens when somebody has a seizure or has electrical shock. Where is, the, where is most likely the dislocation going to happen to the shoulder? Posterior, right? So the internal rotators are actually stronger than your external rotators. And that's the reason why the shoulder dislocations and seizures and electrical shocks are most likely posterior. And the internal rotators are things like the pec major, the latissimus, and subscapularis. Subscapularis rupture would have what findings? So three key findings on examination. A positive Gerber's liftoff. Don't forget, a lot of times what they'll do, they'll fool around with you, whether it's a negative test or a positive test. Positive Gerber's liftoff test means they can't do it. Okay? Positive Gerber's liftoff test. Weak, weak uh, internal rotation and an increase in passive external rotation. Test question right here. Two shoulder stabilization procedures, increased passive external rotation, weakness when using the arm in front of his body, inability to lift back of his hand away from his back, positive Gerber's lift off test. Which of the following muscles? Subscapularis. Stat static and dynamic restraints of the shoulder, static, are shown there. 
dynamic or, or the ones I've seen as more key testable items, rotator cuff, biceps, tendon, and scapular thoracic motion. Example of a test question, falling anatomic structures provide dynamic contribution to shoulder stability. Rotator cuff musculature. This is a beautiful diagram of actually the glenohumeral ligament complex. Remember the anatomic relationship I said on that previous diagram, cross-sectional anatomy, middle glenohumeral ligament in relationship to the subscapularis. The functions are key test water. Superior, restraint to inferior translation in adducted shoulder, the middle glenohumeral ligament. Secondary, secondary stabilizer for inferior translation in adduction. And one of the primary stabilizers in about 45 degrees of shoulder arc. Inferior glenohumeral ligament is by far the most key testable item on this. Primary stabilizer for the anterior inferior stability and adduction. And we'll go over some of the diagrams here to help you visualize what these are actually doing. Superior glenohumeral ligament, middle, tighten with adduction, external rotation. Inferior glenohumeral ligament complex tightens with abduction, external rotation. Arm in this position. Primary soft tissue restraints to anterior glenohumeral translation in the abductor shoulder include what ligaments? And don't forget the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex is comprised of two things, both a posterior inferior and anterior inferior ligament complex. It's like a hammock for your shoulder. Primary static restraint to anterior translation humeral head in relation to glenoid at 90 degrees shoulder abduction. Once again, IGHL. Middle glenohumeral ligament, and I highlight there in color, is that the anterior translation of the slightly abducted humerus is one of the testable items at 45 degrees. Remember, inferior glenohumeral ligament is 90 and external rotation. Middle is right here, about 45 degrees position of your arm. What limits flexion and external rotation? This is becoming a testable item now. This is something that I probably wouldn't have got when I took my boards. It's a rotator interval. Rotator interval, capsule shoulder, acts to limit what type of motion? Shown there. Shoulder flexion and external rotation. Standard posterior shoulder arthroscopy portal intervals where? Too low placement, a very low placement, can injure the axillary nerve, but below the infraspinatus. How do you move the axillary nerve away from your field during the Hendry anterior approach to the shoulder? What do you actually do to position of the arm? There's only one structure on your arm that gets tight with internal rotation. When you're doing that approach, you can physically feel it, so you externally rotate the arm and adduct it, release pressure off the nerve. Don't forget it's the approach between the deltoid axillary nerve, pectoralis major, which is medial and lateral pectoral nerve, and we already went the clavicular and sternocostal head innervation on that. This is also part of your handout, and the reason why is I, I just find this as key testable material. I see it year in, year out on examinations or past examination. Quadrangular space, easy way to remember that is quad is four. So there's either going to be four words, which is posterior, humor, circumflex artery, or four syllables, axillary. That's the easy way. That's the way I remembered it. Quad is four, and that's the way I remember what goes through the, the uh, quadrangular space. Triangular space is circ uh, circumflex scapular artery. Triangular interval is always a key test of item because you've got to know who's the radial nerve buddy in that space. It's a profunda brachial artery. We'll go over some test questions on that. Interval for posterior approach to the shoulder is infraspinatus. Terry's minor. Why is that important? Okay, it's important because you do not want to carry your dissection below the teres minor because then you hit the quadrangular space, which contains your axillary nerve posterior humeral circumflex artery. You also do not want to put excessive traction on the infraspinatus because you can damage the suprascapular nerve. Quadrangular space, shown here in diagram. Remember four syllables or four words. That's the easy way I remember that. Posterior humor, circumflex artery, and axillary nerve. Boundaries are shown on the diagram. Quadrangular space is important. It's just very simple. On the posterior approach, do not carry your dissection below the teres minor. You'll never enter that space. Structure label C. Now, this is one of the, you remember I told you the hint where I tracked down those diagrams back to 1992? This is one of those diagrams that I think show up year in, year out. So it's, it's good to know this one. Structure label C in the posterior approach to the shoulder is the what? 
It's the boundary between the quadrangular space, it's the medial boundary, long head of the triceps. And that's also on the second page of the diagram that was the extra handout. It's on that. Push your shoulder. Just label those. A is deltoid. B, axillary nerve. Push your humerus circumflex artery. C, long head of triceps. D, circumflex scapular artery. E is teres minor. F is infraspinatus. Triangular space, shown here. Circumflex scapular artery. And the way I remember this one, even though it, didn't, it may not work out for the triangular interval, but three words, circumflex scapular artery. Triangular interval is now further down the, who's the body of the radial nerve? Profunda brachial artery. Okay, example test questions. Which following artery is found in a triangular space bordered by the teres major, teres minor, and triceps? Triangular space, circumflex scapular artery. Nerve that traverses a triangular interval supplies which of the following muscles? Another hoop to jump through. Nerve that's in triangular interval is radial, brachial radialis. Muscle that separates a triangular from quadrangular space of shoulder is innervated by the same nerve that supplies what muscle? That muscle was triceps, long head of the triceps. Triceps is now innervated by radial nerve, which is the anconeus. During open reduction internal fixation of the glenoid fracture shown, exposure to the anterior lateral scapular border for extension of plate is limited by which of the following structures? What runs right underneath there? And I'll show you a diagram. It's axillary nerve. Axillary nerve right underneath. Arthroscopic view, left shoulder. Posture reporter indicates what type of lesion, superior aspect. Slap lesion. This is a great question. Open reduction internal fixation device shown may be associated with osteonecrosis due to what? And it's, you've got to know the blood supply to the humerus. The blood supply to the humeral head is the, off the anterior humeral circumflex artery. It's an artery that goes up called the arcuate artery on the lateral border of the bicipital groove. Injury to the arcuate artery, the lateral border of the bicipital groove. That's why this plate puts direct compression on it and it can cause osteonecrosis. I'll show you here. Coming down, right here, anterior humeral circumflex artery. Branches, the arcuate artery coming up to supply the humeral head. Three portions of the axillary artery. Supreme thoracic is the first. Second is thoracochromial. Remember that branch with the CA ligament, key testable material. And then the third is the anterior humeral circumflex is important there, the arcuate humeral head blood supply. Don't forget the, also the posterior humeral circumflex is in the quadrangular space. Anyways, easy way to remember this also is the division of your axillary artery, the number of divisions, so like the second division has two branches. Your third division has three branches. That's the easy way to remember. Let's go to a test question. And one of, the, one of the things that you want to know on this, proximal humeral fractures, where is the axillary artery actually tethered to your humerus? Well, look at, the, look at the leash there with the posterior and anterior humeral circumflex artery. It makes sense that that's where you're going to have most of your vascular injuries on these patterns, fractures. This is what is shown. Proximal humerus fracture right here, that leash is disrupted. And this is an example of a test question. Here's a true arteriogram. In the test question, and I can't, even though it didn't show up well, this is the humeral shaft and the humeral head is down here. 80-year-old, completely displaced proximal humerus fracture, faint pulse, angiography is performed. Where is the vascular injury located? Well, where it's going to be most tethered. The origin of the anterior and posterior humeral circumflex arteries. Top 10. Brachial plexus data dump. You've got to know it. That's also why I included an extra handout on it. Do not forget reverse orientation. No, pre your preclavicular nerve branches. There's four. That's shown there. Blood supply to the humeral head. Anterior humeral circumflex artery in specific, the arcuate artery. Test question there with that anterior humeral plating. Why do you get osteonecrosis? Suprascapular nerve. Do not forget it. It goes under that ligament, the superior transverse scapular ligament, okay? There's water over the bridge. The arteries are over top of that. You can have entrapment at that site, which will result in atrophy, denervation atrophy of both the infra and supraspinatus at the spinal or glenoid notch. It's just the infraspinatus. 
Shoulder stability versus motion. Got to know your inferior glenohumeral ligament complex is probably the most important. Arterial bleeding from release of the CA ligament is due to a chromial branch with chromial. Do not forget the painfully massive rotator cuff tears you're debris. Do not take that ligament because it's your superior restraint. Quadrangular space, axillary nerve, posterior humerus circumflex artery, triangular interval, radial nerve, profunda brachial artery, triangular space, circumflex scapular, and rotator cuff functional deficits, which we covered on exam questions. That ends that section. We're going to go to the next section. Arm and forearm anatomy rule. What we'll do is after this section, we'll get, we'll get a quick break and then start back in the spine. This is how we get a lot of the injuries. This is Moab, picture from there. Key testable item on this slide, and let me get the pointer back up. Musculocutaneous nerve comes down. Do not forget it's between the biceps and brachialis, but don't forget it's in termination shown here. Lateral anabrachiocutaneous nerve. Another key testable item is actually the path followed by your radial nerve. This space right here where the spiral groove is approximately 13 centimeters up from the elbow joint. It pierces the lateral intermuscular septum approximately 70.5 centimeters up from the lateral portion of the elbow. Goes between the brachioradialis and the brachialis. What muscles cross the elbow joint and have origins on the scapula? Let's go through that and let's think. Triceps does. And biceps. Don't forget also one of the trick questions they try to do on the triceps is that post your approach to the uh, humeral shaft. Don't forget you're splitting the medial head to get down to the humeral shaft. So you physically split that. The other key testable item I showed you was uh, the long head actually on the quadrangular space. What muscle originates from both the scapula and the humerus? Scapula and the humerus. Well, the medial head of the medial head of the triceps we already covered is directly from the humerus, so it's the triceps. Cross section anatomy, and just know these. What artery runs with the radial nerve? We already covered that on the triangular interval, the profunda brachial artery. What nerve runs between the basilic vein and the brachial artery? The median nerve. What nerve is medial to the basilic vein? Key testable item because of elbow arthroscopy, medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve. This I just showed you, this is from Clemente's Anatomy. It's a good cross-sectional diagram, just to highlight some of those. Right here, median nerve, as we said before. Medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve is actually, now it's a relationship directly to the basilic vein. What is the musculocutaneous nerve supply? Corticobrachialis, biceps, and the brachialis. And I found these diagrams extremely helpful. This is, uh, the, I list there, if you want to get it, Trindle's aids to the examination of peripheral nervous system. I'll explain why these diagrams are particularly important, especially for hand questions. Corticobrachialis, biceps, brachialis. Don't forget it's in termination is the lateral annual brachiocutaneous nerve, which we showed the distribution on the first slide, how it actually traverses your arm. Bank heart repair, ox your intern. You already know you're in trouble when ox your intern is retracting. Vigorous retracts at the origin of corticobrachialis, short head of the biceps. Where would you see a sensory distribution deficit? He's now stretching the musculocutaneous nerve, so the lateral annual brachiocutaneous, so where? Lateral cutaneous nerve for one. And the reason why they get you there, you've been calling the lateral annual brachiocutaneous. It's also known as lateral cutaneous instead of lateral arm. Axillary nerve, what is the supply? Teres minor, deltoid, don't forget it travels the quadrangular space. Innervation of the forearm, this is actually something that Dr. Miller had in his review. Superficial flexors, real easy, median nerve except the half of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Deep flexors, also again median nerve except for the ulnar half, FDP. Superficial extensors is a radial nerve with the PIN innervating the ones I have highlighted. Deep extensors are the posterior interosseous nerve. Radial nerve supplies what? Triceps, radial portion of brachialis, anconeus, and posterior interosseous nerve. And the reason why I want to highlight this real quick, pay particular attention to the way this diagram is. You look here at the posterior interosseous nerve and its travel. One of the questions they'll do on the board examination, say, say for example, you have a posterior interosseous nerve palsy. They'll ask the question, what is the last muscle expected to return? We just got to know how those innervate down the list, and that's where these diagrams actually help out. Look at the anterior interosseous nerve, the posterior interosseous nerve, and you know it's going to be extensor indices on this diagram. That's the last one to come back. What's the first? You just flip it. You look at the first thing innervated by the nerve. 
So these diagrams are extremely useful in looking at nerve palsies that are test questions on the hand. Lecronon osteotomy, posterior humerus, is treated interarticular fracture. The question then is, is what mental safe distance lessens the risk of vulnerability in the radial nerve encounters between the articular surface at the trochlea, spiral group posteriorly, and the lateral intermuscular septum? We covered that before. 13 centimeters posterior at the spiral groove, 7.5 centimeters where, where it pierces the lateral intermuscular septum. Superficial extensors. I have listed here, radial nerve innervated ones, posterior interosseous innervated, deep extensors, PIN, shown here, median nerve supplies, structures listed. Once again, look at your diagram for anterior interosseous nerve, last to come back, pronator quadratus, and for some odd reason, they love pronator quadratus and cross-sectional anatomy. Structured body in the median nerve in the arm, Break your artery. Superficial flexures. Median nerve, except they have for the FCU. Deep flexors, once again, median nerve. Another one of our favorites. Tip the error points to the muscle innervated by the uh, question then is, is what the heck muscle is that? Elbow, okay, medial side is localized there. So let's go back. Right here. Pronator teres. Sorry, I didn't come up right on the slide. What nerve is it? It's a median nerve then. Ulnar nerve supplies what? Don't forget, it comes from the medial cord. Structure is indicated there. Diagram is shown. These diagrams are very helpful, as you can tell just from going through it right now, really systematically enables you to determine what's going to happen during nerve lesions, things like that, nerve injuries. Muscle supplied by the nerve indicated by the arrow on a nerve right there in the groove goes to the FDP of the ring finger, the ulnar side of your hand. Elbow review. Joints, one of the testable items that actually is more on the pediatrics, you've got to know what joints have intraarticular metaphysis. That way, if you have osteomyelitis, you can have direct septic arthritis extension. Those joints are the hip, the shoulder, the elbow, and the ankle. Four joints can produce septic arthritis from direct metaphyseal extension. This is more from your pediatric lectures. Proximal femur, distal fibula, proximal humerus, and radial head. What is normal articular alignment, carry angle, distal humerus? This test question actually came out. This patient had tardy on nerve palsy due to the increased uh, carrying angle from a subcommon humerus fracture and malalignment. Seven degrees valgus tilt is normal. Where should the anterior humeral line cross on a lateral radiograph of the child's elbow? Through the middle third of the capitellum. Flexing and extension, the elbow occur about an axis rotation that corresponds to a line drawn through the centers of the trochlea and capitellum. Do not forget, they'll also try to trick you. They'll have this question, say, a blank age patient, pediatric age patient has elbow trauma, is complaining of an elbow pain right now. What do you do for this? And you've got to know your anatomy. Is that normal radio head anatomy? No, this is congenital radio head dislocation. So the question is, what do you do for it? You don't do anything for it. You do symptomatic treatment. The other thing that I want to point out on this diagram that becomes a key test item, please note the relationship of the olecranon here to your colonoid. Don't forget how much higher your colonoid is compared to your olecranon. And that's why type 2, Reagan type 2, type 3 are associated with elbow instability. Type 1 little fractures off the tip do not re are not as a result of capsular revulsion. There's no attachment there, okay? And we're going to go over that. That's why on elbow arthroscopy, one of the things they'll show you, a porter elbow arthroscopy, you'll see the tip of the colonoid. That's because it's an interarticular structure. The first attachment is 6 millimeters distal to that, actually, of the capsule. Ligament of stabilizer elbow, one of the things, the reason why I put this slide up and use different terminology is they'll try to fool you. Don't forget lateral ulnar collateral ligament is the same as a radial collateral ligament, okay? Anterior band of medial collateral ligament is the same as the ulnar collateral ligament, shown on this diagram. What are the three primary constraints that are necessary and sufficient for stability of the elbow? Necessary and sufficient. 
coenoid, lateral on a collateral ligament, anterior band of medial collateral ligament. Prominent screw head, tip can interfere with full rotation of forearm. What is the safe zone for radial head fracture screw placement? How do you actually position your arm during surgery when you do this? That's all it's asking. If you look here at the diagram here, it shows the safe zone placement. 110 degrees, centered laterally with forearm in neutral rotation, neutral rotation. This is a diagram to show you things. Don't forget uh, up here the uh, tennis elbow. We'll go over the test question on that. Tennis elbow, you think what? Stensor carpi radialis brevis attachment. Radial nerve emerged on the lateral side of the arm. Brachialis, brachioradialis. Anterior lateral epicondyle. Don't forget cross sectional diagrams. One of the reasons why I had to highlight the brachial plexus again, do not forget the terminations, both the medial brachial cutaneous off your medial cord. Key testable item on that is it runs with what vein? Silic vein. How about now flip it, the lateral anal brachial cutaneous, which is the end termination of the muscutaneous nerve. Runs with the cephalic vein. Medial one is the one that can be damaged during elbow arthroscopy, portal placement. What nerve lies in subcutaneous tissue, immediate lateral cephalic vein? We just covered it on the diagram. Lateral anal brachial cutaneous nerve. Why can you see the coronary process during elbow arthroscopy? Something I just covered a little bit ago. Anterior elbow capsule does not attach to the tip of the coronoid. It's located actually six millimeters distal tip. Type one fractures then of the coronoid are not due to capsular avulsions. It's a shearing injury, and that's why it has a high non-union rate, because why? You don't have muscular attachments that bring blood supply to it. That's why you have such a high non-union rate. Anatomic reason why you have a complication. Lateral coca approach to the elbow. Arm is supinate or pronate to pr protect the PIN. Which way do you go? Pronate the forearm to protect the PIN. Contrast that to the Henry approach, where you have to supinate. Push your lateral approach to the elbow for radio head excision. How do you actually move the PIN away from the operative field? So they throw something else in addition to it. We now we've got to pronate it. What else do you have to do? You have to flex the elbow. Flex the elbow and then pronate in addition. Surgical interval for exposure to fracture of lateral condyle, the distal humerus, is between the brachioradialis and triceps. Top five, arm and elbow. Primary restraint to valgus elbow low, anterior bundle, medial collateral ligament. Okay. Lateral epicondylitis, extensor carpi radialis brevis. Anterior medial arthroscopy porter, medial anal brachiocutaneous nerve. Always know cross sectional anatomy and review that. Coker approach to Elmo, you pronate to protect the PIM. Go down to the forearm, cross-sectional anatomy, forearm questions. Radial nerve enters between the forearm between what muscles? Brachioradialis and brachialis. Median nerve splits the pronator teres and lies between what muscles? FDS and FDP. Ulnar nerve is just the opposite, FCU and FDP. And I put this diagram in just to help you out. Between the FCU and FDP, ulnar nerve, FDS and the FDP, median nerve. Just look at your cross-sectional anatomy. Get those relationships down. Shown here. FCU, FDP, between that is the ulnar nerve, shown here. FDS, FDP, median nerve. Hint, hint. 1992, went back to examination. This is the one that showed up on my boards. I think they're using them. I left it unlabeled just so you can practice. Forearm compartments, superficial flexor, deep flexor, and extensor. Don't forget on the fasciotomies of the forearm compartment syndrome, you do volar first, then measure dorsal to see whether or not you have to do it. Shown here in diagram. Key testable item on this diagram of the arterial supply around the elbows. Don't forget for the uh, bi distal biceps rupture. During the anterior approach to the proximal forearm, exposure to proximal radius will result in ligation of what vessel? Recurrent radial. 
anterior approach is between the brachialis, brachioradialis, and then the brachioradialis and pronator tears distally. This is a great question. I didn't know this, actually. It's a 38-year-old man noticed pain and weakness in the dominant elbow after trying to move his piano three days. Examination now reveals pain, ecchymosis, antibrachial fossus, distal biceps rupture is a preliminary diagnosis. What happens if you don't do anything for this patient left untreated? Forty percent loss of both flexion and supination strength. Don't forget the biceps, important supinator. Lateral approach to the elbow, arm is supinated or pronated. We already covered that. You pronate it. Henry approach, contrast it. It's the opposite. It's between the uh, PT and brachioradialis. You supinate it. Anterior volar approach to the proximal radius for open reduction in for internal fixation. Supinator is detached from the anterior proximal, proximal radius with the arm in what position? Full supination. Diagram shown here directly from Hoppenfeld, and it stresses that point. Once again, pay particularly close attention to these diagrams. These diagrams I've also seen on my exam, okay? Structure labeled G is what? Well, we see the radial nerve coming here, PIN. It's a supinator. We're going to go over the uh, labeling of those. Brachioradialis, don't forget, they love retraction questions. If you retract too hard on brachioradialis, superficial branch of the radial nerve you get. Oxygen intern right there, Army, Navy in the diagram. He's pulling too dang hard. Which structure is the highest risk for injury? Superficial radial nerve underneath the brachioradialis. Posterior approach, proximal forearm. For some odd reason, on the, on the test, things you don't see come up more frequently. And one of the things is intersection syndrome. Do not forget what intersection syndrome is, is on this diagram. I'll highlight the area right here. You got your second compartment muscles, ECRL, ECRB coming down. You outcroppers now from the first compartment now cross over those. And this is the place where intersection syndrome happens between the first and second compartments. Structure labeled I in the following. It's your outcroppers coming across. Abductor pollicis longus. Don't forget the abductor is the one that has multiple slips. And the reason why you also fail injections into the first compartment for decoanes, tenus synovitis, is because it can be multiple slips and you may not have got it with your injection. Okay? Multiple tendon slips on that one. Ox once again returned. We've got to get him out of the OR. Retracted vigorously on C. What structure is most likely to be damaged? Deep radial nerve. Summary of forearm approaches shown here. Cross-section anatomy through the wrist is always key tessel item, and the only reason why I put this level is this muscle right here, pronator quadratus, quadratus anterior interosseous nerve. That, for some reason, shows up. It's a favorite. What nerve innervates the highlighted structure? We just went over it. It's pronator quadratus, anterior interosseous nerve. Remember, these diagrams are extremely helpful in determining what nerve injuries, lacerations, what's expected to first come back, what's expected to last come back. Hint, hint, once again. Diagram showed up on the exam. I left it unlabeled just so you can practice. Top five, median nerve is between the FDS, FDP, ulnar nerve between FCU and FDP. Anterior primary approach to the proximal radius, you supinate. Coca approach, you pronate. Retraction on brachioradialis, don't forget, compression of superficial radial nerve, and know your cross-sectional anatomy. Hand review has been done previously. What I did in the handout, because I heard it went pretty quick, I included in your handout what I felt was key test one material in addition to test questions. Okay, we aren't going over that today. We're going to take a little break right here until I load up the next stuff. But I put that in there for you to review. Also note on that section, the diagrams that are unlabeled are also what I thought the diagrams which are most likely to show up on the exam. We'll come back and start spying. Take a real quick break. All right, for those out, you have a control on this mic. 
says out in the hallway, go ahead and start coming back. Tell me, we switched to now the uh, different mic. Is everybody hear me okay now? Okay. We're going to now begin spine. I know spine was covered separately, but one of the things I mentioned before, my job today is to help you out in what is considered by the academy in the previous test is what's key testable material. Cervical spine, seven vertebrae, normal contour is lordosis. Topographical landmarks are key testable material, always cricoid cartilage at C6, hyoid at C3. Where does the highest percent of next flexion and extension occur? Flexion and extension. 50% at occiput C1. Where does the highest total neck rotation occur? 50% at C1, C2. One of the key references, I think, for this material is a book by Hoppenfeld called Orthopedic Neurology. It is excellent. In the back, the section that I absolutely ignored is a whole thing on my, my dysplasia. I tell you what, if you look through that, you got things down. And I'll actually show you during this lecture why that really helps you out on determining nerve levels for function. It's fantastic. We'll go over some of, those, uh, some of those diagrams and questions from the book. Real quick summary, C5, deltoid, don't forget. Biceps tendon reflex, sensation on the arm shown. C6, don't forget. C5, C6 is the most common level of disc herniation, cervical spine. You're going to hit the C6 nerve root. Don't forget the EMG changes that I was talking about that were shown up directly on my examination, okay? Wrist extension, brachioradialis reflex. Herniated disc between C5 and C6 and pins is what nerve root? C6, most common level. Patient is complaining of what? Example of a testable item. It's a dimyelogram. So you just walk down it. Let me get the pointer back up for you. So one, two, three, four, five, six. You see now this bulge here between five, six. What nerve root? C6. What are they complaining of? C6 nerve root impingement, probable biceps or even wrist extension, most likely wrist extension weakness. They won't complain of brachioradialis reflex, but you'll determine that in examination. They will complain of decreased thumb sensation. Here's an example of a board question, though. Here's how they go to the next level. What EMG findings would you see on this? Don't forget EMG findings for denervation are fibrillations and sharp waves. Okay. We don't necessarily have in this review course an EMG section, but fibrillation is sharp waves, denervation. Okay? What would that person have? Biceps, ECRL, ECRB, fibrillation, sharp waves. C6, wrist extension, triceps reflex, sensation shown, middle finger. C8, finger extension, reflex, none, sensation is shown. T1, inner ossei with no reflex, sensation is shown. Summarize, real quick, easy. Six, seven, seven, eight, curl them, T1. That's the way I just remember when I was on my spine rotation. Real quick way to remember that. Reflexors are shown there as summary. Torso dermatomes, don't forget nipple line is T4, xiphoid process of the sternum is T7. Umbilicus, T10. This is something that will be covered in your rehab lecture. Why are these levels actually important? Well, so you can go through life. For example, to get out of a chair, what do you need to push off? You need C7 on your triceps. So you're going to cover that in the rehab lecture, why these levels actually become very important for patients with spinal cord injury. And this diagram is actually from the next lecture, so that will be, uh, be covered. Key testable items on cross-sectional anatomy. You've got to know the vertebral artery relationship to the longest coli muscle. No questions asked. You've got to know that. You've got to know the longest capitis and cervical ganglion relationship. Contents of the carotid sheath, and we'll go over each one of these. Right now, cervical ganglion shown here. Its relationship, the muscle directly posterior is longest capitis, or the way to think of it, longest capitis, the anterior structure to that is the cervical ganglion. Look at this next muscle, longus coli relationship to the vertebral artery. Sympathetic chain, posterior medial to the carotid sheath. It's closely associated anterior to the longus capitis muscle. 
three ganglia comprise that. And don't forget the one that we talked about before in the other lecture on pre- versus post-ganglionic lesions of the brachial plexus. Disruption of the inferior ganglion could lead to the Horner syndrome. Remember, dry forehead, meiosis. What muscle lies anterior to the vertebral artery? Mongus coli. Four components, carotid sheath, internal carotid artery, common carotid artery, internal jugular vein, in the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve. Beautiful picture here showing the relationship. And don't forget, in this recess right here is what muscle? Directly anterior to the vertebral artery, longus coli. Don't forget the vertebral artery runs in this transverse foramen, except at C7, goes C6 to T1. I mean, C6, excuse me, C6 to C1. Vertebral artery and greater occipital nerve. For some odd reason, this greater occipital nerve is always tested. And the easy way to remember that, if you lie on a couch that doesn't have padding like on that and you feel that numbness on the back of your scalp, it's greater occipital nerve. We'll go over that. Vascular spine, cervical spine, vertebral artery is a branch off subclavian. It sends through the transverse foramina C1 to C6. Please note absence of C7. Posterior to longus coli muscle. After exiting, you've got to know how it exits the foramina at C1. It's traveling superior. It goes on now the top portion of C1, goes posterior, then goes up through the membrane to the foramen magnet, and I'll show you a diagram what that looks like. Other key tessal item is how far can you dissect from midline? Well, the vertebral artery on C1 lies two centimeters from midline, so don't dissect on the question anywhere near two centimeters. You're safe. So if they put an answer, say, how far can you dissect, and one of the answers is two centimeters, you throw that out. That's right where it lives. Shown here, tra traverses C1, I mean C6 through C1. Its relationship up here is particularly important, which we'll highlight on a test question. Right here is this greater occipital nerve. We'll highlight a test question on that. Of course, the vertebral artery is always a key tessal item here. Don't forget it runs on the superior aspect of C1. Goes post here and then traverses the midline to go through the frame of magnum. <laughs> test question. Transverse slice CT scan, atlas. Best describes this course of the vertebral artery. Remember, we said it's on the superior surface, so we got that down. Cephalat surface, posterior arch of C1. Look at the cross-sectional here. There's a better diagram. Comes up through, goes C1, superior surface, goes posterior, and then transverses. Key test why I'm highlighted here. Surgical dissection is to stay within 1.5 centimeters of the posterior tubercle. Right here is the test question. Posterior fusion is arch C1, C2. Important to avoid injury to vertebral artery. How many centimeters lateral midline may be dissected safely? Don't forget, it lives at two, so it's to be safe, you've got to be less than that, 1.5. Great occipital nerve exits the spine at what vertebral level? C1, C2. Ventral ramus of C2. This nerve pierces the semispinalis. This one I spotted him. I just didn't get it. This nerve pierces semispinalis, trapezius, supply sensory innervation to the posterior scalp. They just phrase it different. I don't know why they love this nerve. Greater occipital nerve. Where does it come from? The medial branch dorsal ramus of C2. I think I incorrectly spoke before. It is the medial branch dorsal ramus C2. Ligamentous importance, primary stabilizer, atlanta axial joint, cruciform ligament. Don't forget why that's important, as shown here. What do you need to determine a disruption of C1, C2 and instability? Don't forget how you obtain that measurement. You look for splaying. The summation of the distance of C1 to C2 from the lateral processes here. And that cannot be greater than, what, 6.9. Don't forget how you determine that measurement. Halo pins, halo pins, halo pins. It's going to be on there. Okay? Right here is a great diagram showing this. This is from uh, Brown or Skeletal Trauma. Safe zone is shown here. Next structure going media is superorbital nerve. Next structure over the final sinus is supertrochlear nerve. One of the questions they like to do also, if you draw a line from midline over to this zone, it's 4.5 centimeters. Okay? From midline to the safe zone, 4.5 centimeters. Safe zone for placement anterior halo pins has been determined to avoid injuries to rush structures that lie along its boundaries. Temporal fossa, temporalis muscle laterally, frontal sinus, superorbital nerve medial. You have to be way far medial. Look at where that was on the diagram. 
to hit frontal sinus. How many pounds? Eight pounds covered all that. During insertion of halopens, supratrochlear nerve must be avoided. What location does the supratrochlear nerve exit the skull? Okay. Medial to supraorbital nerve. Medial. Remember the 4.5 centimeters I previously drew. Brief review of cervical approaches. And we're not going to cover too much on this. Anterior approach. Inside the platysma, you do the incision at the level you're going to work with. Inside the deep cervical fascia, invest the sternocleidal and massa. Pretracheal fascia is then incised. You go between the space of the carotid sheath and trachea, and then you have now the prevertebral fascia exposed. Retract on the longest coli to expose the uncovertebral joints. Stay subperiosteal to protect the sympathetic ganglion and recurrent laryngeal nerve. Don't forget that the nerve, recurrent laryngeal nerve, is unpredictable in path on the right-sided approach. The left side lies between the trachea and the esophagus. Posterior approach, stay midline, avoid bleeding. Uh, expose the pinus processes, stay subperiosteal, check, check your x-ray for levels, and do not forget about the C1 dissection question that we already talked about. The vertebral artery is two centimeters from midline. Twelve thoracic uh, bodies, pericostal facets, Kyphosis is normal, 20 to 50 degrees, apex at T7. I have not really seen a test question on that, but I have seen a test question on the next point. Don't forget in the lumbar spine, the lordosis in the lumbar spine is a lot of times due to your intervertebral disc and not the body. It makes sense. If you take a lumbar ver ver vertebrae and just set it down, it lays flat. Your now kyphosis in the thoracic spine is different. The curve is a result of anterior body wedging and minimal disc contribution. So make sure to make that comparison and contrast. Vascular supply, aorta on the left, vena cava and azygos on the right, they love the aorta. If you're placing a pedicle screw in thoracic level around T10, T11, and you're going to go out the left side, what are you going to hit? What structure's right underneath the vertebral body? It's the, it's the, uh, it's the aorta right here. T10 pedicle, you're putting a screw. Left pedicle, you're putting it in. Remember what structures lie on the left. Penetration of the anterior vertebral body, you have pretty brisk bleeding. <laughs> what is it? Descending aorta. This is probably the most tested piece of minutia that I don't even give a darn about, but it's tested all the time. Artery of Adamska West enters on the left side about 80% of the time between T, T, uh, T8, and sometimes you'll see T12 or L1. I put the L1 here. It's the largest medullary feeder. 97% of patients have an additional feeder beside this one, so I don't understand why it's tested, and supposedly loss of this results in anterior spinal artery syndrome. Articular radicularis, radicularis magna is a major anterior medullary artery for the lower half of the spinal cord. Typically enters the spinal canal between T8 and T12. Remember, on the left side. And I put L1 in because I also saw a reference where it actually anatomically has been on down to L1. Approach to the thoracic spine. Don't forget the rib, neurovascular bundle underneath. Dissect over the rib to avoid this bundle. Right-sided approach is favored just because of the artery. comes from the left side, that artery of damska -Wiss. Three column spinal stability covered in your lectures. Do not forget what comprises the columns, though. Okay? Anterior, two-thirds of annulus fibrosis, vertebral body. ALL is the anterior column. Middle column, PLL, posterior third of the vertebral body, and annulus fibrosis. And the posterior complex is the Holdsworth posterior ligamentous complex of the posterior column. Lumbar spine, five vertebral bodies. Test question is lumbar lordosis ranges from what? 55 to 60 degrees with an apex at L3. 66% of the overall lordosis exists from L4 to your sacrum. So a majority of it exists down this way. The disc contribution is significant, unlike the thoracic spine, where it's the, the wedging of the vertebral bodies. Okay. Test question. Which of the following statements most accurately describes the normal sagittal alignment of the lumbar spine? Where does the, I just said, where the most majority of lumbar lordosis exists? Between L4 and the sacrum. Most common cause of back pain in children and adolescents is? Scotty dog. Spinal lysis. 
defect in the pars and interarticularis. The only reason why I highlight this is for some odd reason, it's difficult to understand truly where this pars is. The pars is right as shown on the diagram, right there, bam. Surgical approach to lumbar spine, I don't really care if they come off with a cob, I don't really need to know them. But why, do we, why can we get away with doing this? It's because it's segmental innervation. That's the reason why we can get away with this. Nerve roots. Herniated disc impinges on the traversing nerve root, not the exiting one, unless it's a far lateral disc herniation. When does a herniation at L4 compress the nerve root then? Far lateral. Intervertebral disc, and the easy way to remember this, it's soft in the middle, hard on the outside, so the collagen on the outside is type 1, hard, bone, O and E, type 1 collagen, soft in the middle, type 2. 88% water, high polysaccharide contest, Interdiscal, now this is, this is minutia that they actually tested on, but it makes sense. When is your interdiscal pressure the highest and when is it the lowest? It's the lowest when lying supine, but the highest, I always put down the answer that you're just sitting in a chair. It's the highest. It's not. It's sitting in a chair, flux forward with weights in the hand. <laughs> but that, that's how it shows up on the examination. That's the reason why I put this. I went back to the original study that showed this. And it was actually a study done on residents and medical students that actually did this study. Okay, so low supine, sitting flexed forward position in a chair with weights in hands. Don't forget type 1 collagen on the hard outside annulus. Okay, type 2 in the middle, 88% polysaccharide, I mean 88% water. Tcastable item is shown here on the diagram itself. This is an example of uh, spinal stenosis. It's actually a beautiful diagram. Do not forget the relationship. Superior facet from vertebra below is located in this position. Okay? Anterior approach to the lumbar spine, abdominal incision midline, rectus abdominis, finger sweep through the peritoneum, protect viscera, bladder, nerve vascular structures, and one of the things that I have no idea what it is, retrograde ejaculation, I don't want it, but injury to which plexus anterior to the L5? Which one is it? There's either there's a hypogastric plexus, either superior or inferior. Okay, and we'll go through it. Which one is it? Anterior surgical lumbar spine may result in post or retrograde ejaculation. What structure? Superior hypogastric plexus. Please know that. Lies over L5. Okay, so your anterior inner body fusions. Be very careful about that. Interdestral, we already covered this. Supine, highest, blah, blah. Sitting, flex forward, weights, and hands. Neurological levels, <coughs> lower. Uh, L4, foot inversion. And do, the easy way to remember that you're firing L4 when you walk, take a look at your shoes. Look where it wears out. It wears out on this outside portion. So L4, you fire a tib ant. Tib ant's also an inverter. So you're stuffing the outside portion of your heel. Okay? You've got to know, one of the things going to come up on your rehab tactic, talk that you need to know is how your gait pattern is. And one of the things when you swing through on gait, you're flexing your tib ant to clear your foot. It's also an inverter. So that's shown here, foot inversion. T4, patella tendon, one of the key, one of the minutia that's also that I don't particularly like. Your patella reflex, even though we say it's L4, it has contributions all the way from L2 to L4. And I'll show you the test question that highlights that. Sensation is localized there. Easy way to remember the patella reflex is predominantly, and I underline predominantly L4, is just remember the quad, four. Clinical findings occur as a result of this lesion. Well, what do they have? You see a disc herniation, L4, L5, that is not central, that's far lateral. Which nerve root are you going to get? L4, right? So you would think then you'd have an absent knee jerk reflex. The answer is no. Your knee jerk is contribution from L2 to L4. So let's keep on looking down that list. Straight leg raise is really L, uh, going down to L5, S1. Femoral nerve stretch test, ding, ding, ding. And the reason why I highlighted this question, I missed it. I put knee jerk reflex and just went on. It's, I, I didn't realize until I actually looked it up. Knee jerk is actually a little bit more involved than just L4. L5 is shown. Easy way to remember L5 is just look at your five toes to bring them up. EMG demonstrates fibrillation sharp waves, so you know you've got a denervation pattern. Medial hamstring and gluteus medius. What neuro neurological level is involved? Okay, medial hamstring and gluteus medius, L5. Don't forget what else would be involved. We just covered the toe flexors, I mean toe extensors. Right there's a the clinical picture. 
How do you assess hamstring function? Do not forget that hamstrings are dually inverted, innervated. Medial hamstrings are L5. Lateral hamstrings or the biceps femoris are S1. So semi-membranosus, semi-tendinosus are L5. Biceps femoris is S1. S1 level. Perineus longus, Achilles reflex. What would an EMG show in a patient with L5 S1 disc herniation and assume a central herniation with S1 nerve root impingement? Sharp waist, perineus longus brevis, FHL gastroc, lateral hamstring, gluteus maximus. How do you assess gluteus maximus? So don't forget it's S1, as shown highlighted by the previous question. Low extremity dermatomes, we already covered T10. Do not forget the distribution at the foot, L4. What supplies sensation? What, what is the nerve branch that goes, gives you sensation down here? Saphenous, what's it from? Femoral nerve, longest branch of femoral nerve. Goes all the way down, we'll cover that in a little bit later. This is what I was talking about in uh, Hoppenfeld's neurology, which I think is extremely valuable in learning neurological levels. If you look at this diagram now, just pay particular, are the hips flexed or not? Hips are flexed. Is the knee extended or not? Yes. Is the foot inverted? Yes. Is it dorsiflexed? Yes. So what we can do now is have a real quick way to determine these levels. So let's look at it. So the patient had hip flexion, so you know these levels are actually involved. He did not have hip extension, so S1 would not be involved in this patient. Okay? The knee was extended, so you know at least down to the L4 level he has, a, he has intact function. Flexion was not there, so you know you don't even have L5 or S1 working. The foot was dorsiflex and inverted, so you know you have L4 function. So it's very easy when you go back to this diagram to tell this kid has L4 working. And that's why in that back portion of the Hoppenfeld book, I initially disregarded it and didn't look at it. It's very makes it very easy to get these levels down. So this, the findings is, is L4 is intact. So this kid has L4-5 neurological level. L4 is intact. L5 is not. I show there that he has hip flexion, adduction, uh, knee extension, because he has unopposed quads, partial ankle dorsiflexion, and inversion. Sensory is located there. Patellar reflex, primarily L4. No function on bowel or bladder. And this is the diagram that's actually in the book that are extremely helpful in determining what is. You have a non-functioning patchless anus, bladder is not functioning, your reflex would be absent at the Achilles but intact at L4 level, which is the knee. So what is the myeloma level for this patient? You can look at it now and just nail it. You've got hip flexion, knee extension, you're, you're now dorsiflexing the foot and inverting it, L4. Okay? So use that book to help you out, and it makes it real quick to get all the levels down. Confusing testable items, ismic spondylolisthesis, radiculopathy, L5-S1, causes L5 radiculopathy. What about L5-S1 radiculopathy? Don't forget it gets the traversing now, nerve root. S1 radiculopathy. Degenerative spondylolisthesis occurs commonly at what level? 4-5. And we're going to skip this. I know uh, the, the uh, partial uh, cord injuries have been covered already. We'll skip that. And I list, I have uh, test questions also that are covered during that. I'm going to go right to the lower extremity now. Pelvis anatomy review. Don't forget that the posterior SI ligaments are the strongest. Okay. One of the things that you want to pay particular attention to on your examination is any indication. Remember, there's no bony stability of your pelvis. It's all an x-ray shows you just a picture in time. So you've got to look for other findings to determine whether a hemipelvis is unstable. Look at your iliolumbar ligaments, attachment to the transverse process L5. You look for disruption of those to give you an idea of vertical instability. Here it also shows the ligaments. Sacred spine and sacred tubers. Don't forget to disrupt the sacred spine and sacred tubers ligaments. You have to have greater than 2.5 of disruption on the anterior pelvis, 2.5 centimeters. This is a great example of that. You remember I told you they play that game with rotating diagrams? This is, a, this is one that's a, a great one to do it on because your orientation directly influences your answer. The way you cor correctly draw the line on this diagram, you find on the diagram where your anterior superior leg spine is. Okay? Then you just draw a bisector of the acetabulum. Bam. You draw that. Anything now that's posterior to that line is a safe zone. 
Anterior is badness. Okay? Let's go over the test question then. Do not forget reverse orientation. Oh, this we're going to skip. Well, well, we'll do it. I need a break. This is, don't forget reverse orientation. Things aren't always as they appear. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I put that there is this is the one that they're going to get you on, okay? The easy way to remember it, find your anterior superior iliac spine, draw your bisector to acetabulum, everything posterior is good, every anterior is bad. So what's the label D in this diagram? What are you going to hit? So there you draw your bisector, label D, external iliac artery and vein. Let's flip that now. Anterior inferior quadrant screw, greater risk for injury, is the obturator. Okay? Femoral nerve palsy associated with total hip is most commonly associated with what? Bad retractor placement. Inner replacement of retractors. This is a great picture. This guy had stress fractures that completed it during the race. Oh, yeah. Once again, diagram from Hoppenfeld Neurology, hip flexion, okay, iliosos, hip adduction, obturator nerve, hip abduction, superficial gluteal nerves, gluteus medius, hip extension, gluteus maximus, the inferior gluteal nerve, knee extension, quadriceps, the femoral nerve. Don't forget the branch of the femoral nerve goes down to supply the saphenous sensation on the medial side. Don't forget this diagram that I previously showed you for the myelodysplasia spatial questions. Lumbar sacral plexus, and I hope this diagram showed up well. It's from the self-assessment examination, though, if, if it does not show well in your thing. I don't expect you to know everything on this diagram, but at least know the key testable items. The key testable items are as follows. Okay, F. Get the pointer back up. F is the obturator nerve. E, key test item, L2 to L4. And the reason why it's important to know this, they won't label the diagram as 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. One of the things, if you even know where these innervations come off of, you can at least make a reasonable guess. So you know femoral nerve is L2, L4. You can at least guess 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you know, 2, 3, 4. You can guess which one of those femoral nerve and at least eliminate some of the possibilities. G is superior gluteal. H is inferior gluteal. And I is the sciatic nerve. Sort of components of lumbar sacral plexus this is a busy diagram, but from Clemente Anatomy. We won't go over that right now. Do not forget now this part of the sacral plexus going down further is that the sciatic nerve has both a tibial and a common perineal segment that is very important to know the orientation of that segment. The reason why is the perineal division is more lateral. So if you think about when you're doing total hip arthroplasty and errantly pace a retractor, what nerve are you most likely going to hit? That's what's most lateral, which is the perineal nerve division. Okay? So knowing anatomy also helps you out in getting the questions right. Common neural injury at the time of primary total hip arthroplasty is, well, we know sciatic, but which division? Well, an an anatomy tells you that. It's the lateral one, perineal division. Which structure innervates the quadriceps, quads, femoral nerve? And if you can't even, if you don't even have a guess, you know it's L2 to L4, so just count up. L2 to L4 is here, so look, you, you can at least guess, you can narrow down your guess to, to three here but it's the largest one. It's the femoral nerve. What structure innervates the gluteus medius? Superior gluteal nerve, G. C is innervated by what? What is C? Tensor fascia lata, superior gluteal nerve. Don't forget navel, nerve, artery, vein, Empty space and lymphatics at the femoral triangle here. Muscle most lateral in Florida femoral triangle is iliacus. Here's a way to remember that if you want to write those down. Iliacus sos pectineus at Dr. Longus. Isopec ad long is the way I remember it. Order of structures, femoral canal region from lateral medial. Well, if it's isopec I long, so I know it begins with iliacus, so I can take off at least three of these. Navel is next, nerve, artery, vein, so right there.
structure innervates the AD ductors, the obturator nerve, shown as F on the diagram. Patients with hip disease may complain of knee pain, which is primarily caused by irritation, which is the following branch of the obturator nerve. Very important. Don't forget something as simple as radiographing a joint above and below the patient's complaint. Okay? Branch of the doctor Magnus can give you knee pain. So simultaneously, if you have hip pathology, they can present with just knee pain. What structure innervates the gluteus maximus? Inferior gluteal, S1. H on your diagram. What structures pass below the piriformis? And Dr. Miller had a mnemonic for this, POPS IQ. Pudendal, obturator, internus, posterior, femoral, cutaneous nerve, sciatic, although the sciatic can go through the piriformis about 2% of the time, inferior gluteal and quadratus femoris. Hip thigh review. Don't forget what I mentioned before in the lecture is joints within our articular metaphysis. One of them is the hip in the pediatric population. The nerves and what they innervate are shown here in a diagram that I put in your, in your handout. Femoral nerve, obturator nerve, sciatic, don't forget the peroneal division, the key tessile item on that. Short head of biceps is the only structure in the thigh that is innervated by the peroneal nerve division. And they'll phrase it as something such as the patient has a bumper injury to the car and he has a foot drop now. How are you going to determine where the injury is at? And you can do an EMG in the, and you'll find the short head of the biceps would be innervated. So you know that the injury level is below the fibular head. Okay? Tibial division shown there. Quick vascular summary. External iliac becomes the femoral artery after traversing the inguinal ligament. Profunda femoral artery gives rise to the medial and lateral femoral circumflex arteries. Medial femoral circumflex is the one to know. It goes up, then curves around, goes up to the lateral epiphyseal artery, which supplies your head. And we're going to cover the blood supply to the head here. External iliac becomes the obturator artery. Shown here on diagram from Browner's text. One thing that's becoming a key test, well, I don't know, I'm not sure why, and I think it's just because we haven't paid attention to, is this descending genicular artery. Seen should be seen on approaches to the medial aspect of the distal femur. Metastasis of the distal femur, approach medially, right there. The sec vastus, off the uh, vastus medialis, off the anterior aspect. What artery course is the anterior aspect of the septum? Descending genicular, what we just covered. Blood supply to femoral head, key test of item, that's why I highlight in red. Birth to four years old, primary medial and lateral circumflex artery in addition to ligament teres. The test item always is this four-year-old to adult. And the reason why this became about is because they started to do integrate femoral nails in the pediatric population and resulted in osteonecrosis of the femoral head. The reason why is because the blood supply there is your posterior superior, posterior inferior retinacular from the medial femoral circumflex, the, the posterior superior was the one that was damaged in the integrate femoral nail placement. And I have a diagram on that. Don't forget the adult is medial femoral circumflex. It comes up and around, goes to the lateral epiphyseal artery, which now goes to the blood supply to the head. Femoral shaft fracture, 10-year-old boy, treated by a ream-locked intramedullary nail, integrate start point. What is the problem? Osteonecrosis. Why? Because you damage this. This is actually from the paper directly where they describe this. You damage that posterior superior branch with the start point of the piriformis fossa. Non-traumatic AVN of the femoral head is located where? Anatomy. Where is it located? Anterior lateral, shown here. I listed some factors associated with osteonecrosis. They love this one. Structure label J, right here. Makes a 90 degree turn. Is what? Obturator internus. Intermuscular interval is used in hip approaches. This is a summary diagram from Hoppenfeld. So we'll go over that. Smith Pete is now through the sartorius femoral nerve in the tensor fascia lata, superior gluteal. Watson Jones, tensor fascia lata and gluteus medius. And more is, goes right through the gluteus maximus. Dangerous Smith Peterson approach, and this is directly from Hoppenfeld's also. First, lateral femoral cutaneous nerves, 2.5 centimeters below the ASIS, directly over the sartorius. Next, ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery. Okay? And that's the one you actually ligate as shown here in the diagram, directly from Hoppenfeld's. So test questions on the blood supply in that area. Anterior approach, open reduction, dislocated hip. 
What artery penetrates the, ta penetrates the fascia lata serves as a landmark for identification of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Circum uh, superficial circumflex iliac, anterior approach, open direction dislocated hip, intervals develop between the sartorius and tensor fascia lata. Large artery encountered on the anterior surface of rectus femoris is the ascending branch, lateral femoral circumflex, the one you have to ligate. Deep dissection, anterior approach, hip capsule, rectus femoris, divided, reflected distally. Care must be taken not to reflect the co-joint tendons of rectus too distally and fear injury artery that can breathe profusely, which is the descending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex. Medial approach, proximal femur, what artery is located between the adductor brevis and the adductor magnus? Femoral circumflex. Percutaneous tenotomy, adductor longus, ping and flings. Which of the arteries is risk for injury? This one I'll spot him. I just probably would have missed that one. Perineal component, sciatic nerve and thigh runs. Now, this, is, this one shows up consistently. Perineal component, sciatic nerve and the thigh runs on the deep surface of what muscle? Well, we know it innervates the short head of the biceps, but it runs on the long head of the biceps. Know that. Following hip replacement surgery, patient has a perineal nerve palsy. EMG is attained. Which muscles can differentiate whether an injury occurred at the level of hip or fibular neck? We covered that. Short head of biceps. You've got to know that. Important also, one of the things that they'll try to fool you on is patient with pelvic trauma and disruption at the, uh, like, sacral ala fracture. Don't forget the L5 nerve root travels over that. You can also get a foot drop from that. EMG is helpful because it will also show that you have denervation now of the short head of biceps, so you know you have to look proximal. Okay? Cross-sectional anatomy, always key testable item. Name the following muscles. We'll just go over them real quick. Anterior compartment. You got the vastus musculature here, rectus femoris, sartorius, saphenous is now in that compartment. Medial compartment is shown. Don't forget also one of the testable items that comes about this. You have a thigh compartment syndrome. You do the lateral release first, then measure medially to see if you need to do it. Posterior compartment, sciatic nerve there, semimembranosis, tendinosis, biceps femoris. Hint, hint again. This is a diagram from the 1992 test that I saw directly on my boards. I left it on label so you can practice. Which muscle, which nerve innervates the muscle labeled H in the diagram? Well, the question then is what is the muscle labeled H? Well, we know the sciatic nerve lies directly on the long head of the biceps. Long head of the biceps is tibial branch. Knee review. Great picture. Remember I told you in the, uh, the test-taking tip, no one thing cold? All anterior bundles on the ACL, PCL are tight in flexion. You, who's your POW? POW is your PCL. Anterior lateral are now a tight in flexion. And that's the easiest way to remember. No one thing cold, and you can figure out your answer for any question, whether they throw it on the PCL, which is now loose in flexion. You, know? you can figure it out now just by just knowing one thing cold. What genicular artery supplies the cruciate ligaments? Which one? Middle. And here's, the, here's how it looks. Right here is the, right here's the artery. It goes right in the back of your knee, middle geniculate. Which structure encounter between the popliteus tendon and fibular collateral ligament during exposure to the posterior lateral corner of the knee? Inferior geniculate artery. And I'll have a cross section here showing that. Right here, lateral corner of the knee, inferior geniculate lateral genicular artery goes between that, right here, between the fibular collateral ligament and popliteus. Don't forget popliteus is in our articular. When, the, when in the knee, behind what structure is the popliteal artery located? Particularly important for debridement or even repair posterior horn lateral meniscus. I have not seen a test question of recent origin on this. This used to be a big thing on knowing the structure of the knee. I just provided it just for historic and also so that you can find this out. On the lateral part of your knee, do not forget the popliteus is interarticular and that this lateral inferior geniculate artery is a key testable item on that lateral portion of your knee. 
Arthroscopic photograph, intercondylar notch, and knee, absent ACL, so you're looking directly on the PCL. Which of the following structures beneath the probe? What lies directly anterior to your PCL? Ligament of Risberg or Humphrey? Humphrey. It's real easy to know it. Just go anterior or posterior alphabetical order. H is before W. Right there. Humphrey's ligament, anterior, posterior, Risberg. How do you differentiate between an isolated PCL injury, PCL and PLC pattern? It's probably covered by Dr. Miller in his lecture. Asymmetric external rotation. External rotation asymmetry at 30 degrees only is posterior lateral corner. Great question. Bone bruise, acute ACL injury. Where's it at? Lateral femoral condyle, mid third, lateral tibial plateau, posterior one third. You'll have an MRI that'll show just bone bruises without, and they'll do it in such a fashion that you do not see a cut through the ACL. They'll have the cut just going back, and all you see is a bone bruise. You have to determine that's an ACL injury off of that by knowing your anatomy, what's going to happen. Most common site of meniscal tears and acute ACL injury is where? Anatomy? Lateral meniscus. Patient has chronic ACL injury. Where would the bone scans show increasing signal? And one of the things they love to do is to fool you and do tests that were maybe that we're not doing necessarily in residency, but something that they think you should know. So a bone scan for chronic ACL injury, where are you going to have increased signal uptake? Number one, medial compartment. Number two, lateral compartment. And third, then, is the patellofemoral compartment. So chronic ACL goes from medial, lateral, patellofemoral as far as degenerative changes. This is also the reason why we do the debridement or repair. And also the ACL fixation. Discuss the menisci. Right here. Medial meniscus, more C-shaped, more O-shaped as the lateral meniscus. Don't forget the medial menisci has three times greater tears than the lateral. You protect the saphenous nerve during the repair. The lateral itself has the has the um, a lot of time, the cyst, the meniscal cyst, you protect the perineural nerve during repairs. Do not forget also discoid lateral meniscus in a physical exam, exam finding of decreased extension of the knee. Discoid meniscus right here, physical exam finding, lack of full knee extension. They love that one. Main restraint to lateral displacement of the patella is this structure, medial patella femoral ligament which is some reason why some authors are recommending primary repair of this with patella dislocation, primary restraint. When performing total knee replacement, surgeon decides to perform a lateral retinacular release. Preservation of what artery may pre prevent patellar ischemia? Superior lateral genicular. Which structure is innervated by L2 to L4 in the lumbar nerve roots? Who's got this one? Sartorius. Well, then the question then is, is why not A? That's a gracilis, right? Gracilis is. Now, and one of the things that I actually had to look up, this is prior, is that gracilis is actually innervated by femoral nerve, but L2 to L3. Doesn't have L4. Just a nitpicking question. Which of the following tendons typically harvested when performing anterior, you hope is harvested, when performing anterior cruciate ligament surgery with double loop hamstring autograph? Which ones? Gracilis, say grace before T, gracilis semitendinosus, and here's a picture of what that looks like. Do not for, forget gracilis above semi-T. Semi-T is inferior to the gracilis on the medial knee dis, uh, dissection. Which structure is innervated by a branch of the obturator nerve? Gracilis. They love this diagram, and the reason why, you have to know at least something to get yourself oriented on the posterior aspect of the knee, and the thing you use to orient yourself is the plantaris. Plantaris is a lateral structure, and that's shown right here as C. Okay, so let's just label this diagram then. A, biceps femoris. B, common perineal nerve. C, plantaris, and that's key test. That's key thing to know to get yourself the orientation. D is lateral gastroc. E, popliteal vein, F, tibial nerve, G, medial gastroc, H, semitendinosis. Okay, and don't forget semitendinosis is on the semimembranosis. Which nerve innervates the muscle labeled H? So get your orientation right. 
Same I T is the tibial branch, sciatic nerve. Label C now, plantaris is innervated by tibial branch. This is one of our Pittsburgh Steelers. Foot inversion, remember I told you about heel strike. It's going to be covered in the next lecture. Don't forget uh, tibialis anterior, L4, deep peroneal nerve innervated. Don't forget it's all, the posterior tib is also innervated. You test inversion in plantar flexion and evers to remove the effects of your tibialis anterior. Also test by that single stance toe rise. Dorsiflexion is due to what? Tibialis anterior, EHL, EDL, eversion, superficial peroneal nerve, peroneus longus brevis, plantar flexion, tibial nerve, S1 innervated. What muscle is active during the swing phase of gait? Just think about it. You've got to clear your foot. Otherwise, you, you know, people with foot drop, the reason why they have that higher gait is just to clear their foot. So what muscle is going to fire? Tib ant. And we already covered that the hind foot is inverse. That's why you wear the outside heat portion of your shoe, the heel. This will be covered in the next lecture, EMG findings upon gait analysis. How many measurements are obtained for leg compartment syndrome? Four. So here are different compartments. Key testable item is known what's most lateral structure, which is the FHL, which we'll go over. Double incision fasciotomy is shown. Release all four compartments. Components of each compartment, anterior, shown here. Don't forget deep peroneal nerve. Lateral compartment, superficial peroneal nerve. Key testable item is always the deep posterior compartment. And the way you get your orientation, just know the most lateral structure, which is the FHL. They'll show a diagram. I'll show you a particular test question that was very interesting where they, all they want you to do is know what the, what the components are in the deep posterior compartment. Once again, I provided this for you to label. This was a diagram from back in 1992. Deep posterior compartment leg contains three things. Most lateral is FHL. For muscle, FDL, PT, and then the PT artery nerve and vein, posterior tib. Most posterior lateral structure in deep posterior compartments, flexor hallucis longus. You've got to know that. And the reason why is shown on this exam question. Shows a preoperative patient with something with Madura foot, which I didn't know, extended into the leg. All they want you to know is know the cross-sectional anatomy. What is the anatomic and location of this infection? Well, this is in the deep posterior compartment. We already said the most lateral structure is FHL, so you already know that this is posterior tibialis. Okay? Knowing one thing helps you out so much. Label the following. A is gastroc, B is soleus, C, peroneus longus, don't forget, lies on top of the peroneus brevis. Label the following once again. Okay, the addition there is E, fibula, cross-sectional anatomy. Key testable item, and what's, what's abnormal on this right here? 42-year-old man, medial-sided knee pain, six months, playing basketball, abnormal structure is the posterior tibial tendon. I just gave away that one. Interlateral portal during the ankle arthroscopy. More specifically, it's really the dorsal intermediate branch of the superficial peroneal nerve. To go over it, I saw the ankle lecture. Let's go over the different portals real quick. Interlateral medial to the lateral malleolus, lateral to the peroneus tertius. You hit that nerve, dorsal intermediate branch of the cutaneous of the superficial peroneal nerve. Anterior medial portal is medial to the tibialis anterior tendon, lateral to the medius malleolus, and the nerve vascular structure is saphenous nerve and vein. Posterior lateral, the one you'd never want to do is anterior central, and I showed on the diagram the anatomic location of the portals. Don't forget that the ATFL is an intercapsular thickening, okay? Subtalar dislocation is named for where the actual calcaneus goes. Calcaneus goes medial, therefore it's a medial subtalar dislocation, which is most common, so the structures is going to prevent, you block you to reduction of the things that are lateral then. Peroneals, extensor reconnexin, lateral aspect of the navicular. And the opposite is true for lateral subtalar dislocation. 
Tom, Dick, and Harry on the medial side. This diagram is particularly important. If you follow really how the FDL and FHL cross, the master knot of Hendry here, they actually cross at that knot. can be a key testable item. Do not forget that the way the nerve travels down here, the one, the nerve that actually causes the pain associated with plantar fasciitis is nerve most likely responsible for symptoms. First branch, the lateral calcaneal, innervates the muscles I have shown. Medial plantar nerve, think of it like the foot. Plantar nerve is just like the foot. The medial plantar nerve then innervates the digits just almost like in the hand. Okay? You have sensation here to the first three and a half. I have the muscles here that it innervates, including the first lumbricle. Lateral plantar nerve, shown here, your inner osseous, lumbricles. The orientation of these nerves are particularly important. Baxter's nerve, I don't know, did he cover that during your, your review in foot? Baxter's nerve is caused that heel pain. It's from the lateral plantar nerve. What is the one dorsal intrinsic muscle of the foot? Intrinsic muscle that is dorsally located. Did you get it, EDB? Deep perineal nerve innervated. All intrinsic muscles of the foot are supplied by the tibial nerve except that muscle. That's why it's important to know. Deep perineal. Do not forget the innervation pattern, okay, to the inner osseous, which are labeled A. The B are the lumbricals, and the way they are innervated is by the lateral plantar nerve. Important plantar structures. Tibialis posterior muscle shown there. Tibialis anterior insertion. Tibialis anterior is particularly important in patients with cerebral palsy and, and dysfunction, and I'll show you why on a test question coming up. Spring ligament, short ligament, perineus longus goes to the first ray, perineus brevis. Anatomic course of the spring ligament is from calcaneus to the inferior surface of the navicular. This is a great question. This will show up. Patients with polio, dorsal bunions are caused by muscle tendon imbalance. What is the cause of this? And you've got to know what plantar flexes the first ray. Okay? And the reason why your perineus longus is, is now not functioning, so you now dorsiflex the first way, and you get that dorsal bunion. Okay? They love this question. Here's another one of it. Soft tissue release for idiopathic clubfoot. Perineus longus has been transected. What happens if you don't repair it? You get a dorsal bunion because you now take off the plantar flexor of the first ray. Maintenance of blood supply to the talus. The easiest way I remember this is Taylor fractures were associated with flying pains. Planes, and I just think of air traffic control, ATC, I don't know, it worked for me, artery to tarsal canal, main blood supply to talus. And I have a diagram also that shows the, uh, the three different blood supplies to the talus. Removal of accessory navicular, you do an ankle block, and you have sensitivity still. What is that caused by? What's the longest branch of the femoral nerve? Saphenous. And this shows it right here, medial side of foot. That's why if, you, if your anesthesiologist is going to do an ankle block for you and you're going to do some medial side of procedure like removal hardware, make sure they get the saphenous nerve block. Plantar heel spurs originate in what structure? Is it plantar fascia? Quadri flexor digitorum brevis? It's actually flexor digitorum brevis. Foot compartments, we'll skip over that. It's compartment release that's covered in your foot lecture. Incisions are also covered. And good luck on boards. <laughs>